the local communities that if they adopt and enforce our minimum standards, the, um, we will provide flood insurance to residents within those communities. And one of our minimum standards is that the lowest floor of any structure has to be built at or above the base flood elevation. Usually, the higher above that base flood elevation your lowest floor of your house is, the less your flood insurance premiums will be. Well, along those coastal V-zone areas where you expect a high velocity wave action, the lowest horizontal structural member of that structure has to be at or above the base flood elevation. This is to allow the waves to roll under that structure and to create less damage to that structure. In your A-zones, we also have minimum building standards, and one technique that we like to use is to put in openings. Some of us refer to them as flood vents. And in other words, if you put in openings around your foundation walls, which allows the, the water to flow in and flow out and reduce the hydrostatic and hydrodynamic pressures of that water, hopefully in a flooding event, your structure will have less damage because you will maintain the integrity of your foundation. We also require that, and the, the community enforces these, that all your utilities, your furnace, your hot water heater, be elevated to or above that base flood elevation to once again prevent damage. And it has been shown that if your house is built properly in accordance with our minimum standards, those structures that are built properly are less damaged by a flooding event than those that are not. Welcome to St. Simon's Island, one of the most unique beaches to to have a safe and enjoyable visit. We would like to share these five key safety tips to help you ensure you have the best experience possible. To help guide you through our safety tour, we would like to introduce you to Bert, our local lifeguard, and Squirt, our resident beach expert, who will give you a brief orientation. Hey guys, welcome to our beach. I'm Squirt. Stick with me and we will have a great time here on St. Simon's Island. It will only take me a few minutes to get you up to speed and ready to hit the water. The first thing I like to do is check in with the local lifeguard. They have all the information I need for planning my day at the beach. They are easy to spot with their yellow shirt and tall red hair. They monitor the beach every day to ensure your safety. They can tell me about the tide tables, the weather forecast, the UV index to keep my skin from being burned, and all the other things I need to know about the weather and water conditions. I always use the Easy New Flag system. The safety flags are posted on each lifeguard stand. The red flag means high surf and strong currents, which means we should stay out of the water. The yellow flag means caution is advised and to expect moderate surf and currents. The green flag means we have picked a good day and all should be that our weather condition can change quickly so we have to pay close attention to the weather. We can easily avoid this by using plenty of sunscreen, wearing a hat to cover our face, and also by creating some shade with a beach umbrella or a canopy. We also need to stay hydrated by drinking plenty of water all day long. Creepy thunderstorms can pop up really quick with dangerous lightning and strong winds. When I see the lifeguards leave the beach, I leave right with them. Also remember that high winds can send your umbrellas, canopies, and other stuff sailing down the beach. 
so don't forget to secure them. High winds also create big surf and strong waves, so pay close attention when the wind starts to blow. One of the most unique features about our beach is the current. They run every which way. Depending on the tide levels, the current can run as fast as 10 miles per hour. Way faster than I can swim. Looking out from the beach facing the ocean, the current runs either right to left or left to right, depending on which direction the tide is going. A great question to ask the lifeguards is, can you tell me about the current tide direction? This information will help make sure you can plan for a safe swim. Caution! If you are near the shipping channel, the current runs either out to sea or into the river depending on the direction of the tide. Folks, this part is really important to understand. We have a gorgeous sandbar that runs parallel to the beach and it's very inviting. Here are some important things I like to tell everyone that wants to swim out for a visit. The most important thing to keep up with is the tide and current behavior. The current in front of the sandbar can reach speeds of 10 miles per hour and run either right to left or left to right, depending on the tide. The current on the ocean side of the sandbar has a dangerous undertow with a 60 foot drop off. Swimming on that side of the sandbar should always be avoided. Also, we have a very rare situation on St. Simons Island. There is a 6 to 11 foot vertical depth change from the tide and it changes on average every 6 hours. This means that at low tide the sandbar may be dry but 6 hours later the sandbar will be 7 feet underwater. So it is very important to know when it's time to leave the sandbar. At mid-tide, when the water starts to come over the sandbar, there are also strong currents that run across. So please keep that in mind. Thank you for watching my beach safety program. My job is to make sure you have the most fun possible while staying safe during your visit. Perhaps you will help me spread the word, help keep our beaches safe. We are very proud of our unique beach and we want to share it with as many people as possible. Please contact us with any suggestions or feedback from your visit. Goodbye for now. Hope to see you back soon. Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of White House Chronicle. Thank you for coming along. This is a Kindle. I love it. It's very portable. I can put it in my pocket. I can read a book almost anywhere, five minutes, three minutes. I just am addicted to it. But I am very saddened by it as well, because I used to publish books, and I know how many jobs are not there because of this appliance. Think of a book. It had a typesetter, of course an author, we still have authors, but a typesetter, a printer, the person who put the type together, uh, a press person or press crew that did the actual in printing, uh, a binder, a different trade altogether, binding books, warehouse people, truckers, and ultimately sales clerks. That was a lot of jobs. This is the 21st century. Jobs lost for convenience, for comfort, 
and because of technology. It's a huge issue. We don't know whether there will be more jobs because of technology or fewer, but that's our subject today, and that is what we are going to study. And we have two of the world's great experts with us, plus, of course, Linda Gasparello, the co-host of this program. And I'm very glad to welcome to the broadcast for the second time uh, Thomas Cochran, who is the professor of management at the MIT Sloan School of Management and co-director of the Institute for Work and Employment Research. Welcome to the broadcast. Lovely to have you back. And I'm so glad to welcome today John Savage, who's a professor of computer sciences at Brown University, another great and famous university. Welcome to the broadcast. Tom, are we going to have a labor glut when people are going to lose their jobs as artificial intelligence and computers come charging into the workplace well, the even more than they have to this point in time? Well, and that's the question so many people are asking, and I'm trying to get people to ask a different question. Yes, some jobs will go away. Yes, some new jobs will be created. We don't know which one is going to dominate. If we don't do anything, if we're passive about it, we're going to lose more jobs than we create. But if we in engage technology and if we use technology in creative ways, we can both augment work, make work more meaningful, sometimes uh, uh, create some new job opportunities, but find new ways to use technology to solve world problems. So I'm neither a techno-pessimist that uh, you know all these jobs are going to go away, nor, like some of my colleagues, a techno-optimist that, oh, technology is going to take over the world and, and be uh, uh, ubiquitous. I think we can find a way to influence the course of technology effectively, but we can't stop it, and that's the challenge. John, you've been at the, at the very epicenter of developing computer sciences. Uh, you've been with the university for 50 years, which is a substantial amount of time in any job, so I gather you have job security there. Um, no machine is going to start teaching on your behalf next week, right? I currently have job security. <clears throat> I'm a tenured faculty member, and which means that I'm entitled to hold my position as long as I want. However, three years ago, I chose of my own volition to vacate my position at the end of uh, this academic year, the end mm -hmm. of June. And I did so because I thought it would be uh, productive as a founder of my department, as a past chair, to provide an opportunity for a young person. Computers, obviously there are going to be more and more jobs in computers and yes. people who are <coughs> skilled at almost anything to do with them nowadays are in demand. Uh, but how much of that is there? What's the growth there? Is it? 20 percent? Is it 50 percent? Is it going to double and triple? Well, the, the growth in uh, the, so the uh, workforce, uh, the workforce producing software, the, that is to say software engineers, is, uh, is wide open. There, there are lots of positions there. But <clears throat> I would like to emphasize that there are positions also in other fields. We need political scientists to be working in this field. We need social scientists, economists because computer technology and the networking is affecting all of us all over the world. We need people who are diplomats, who can negotiate between nations uh, to set norms of behavior to minimize the, op the friction and to increase the opportunities for cooperation. What so are your thoughts, John, about automated vehicles, et cetera? Are we going to really just become systems managers? Uh, the way, in many ways, airline pilots are systems managers now. They don't do that much hand flying anymore, uh, unless they really want to. Uh, do you think that we're going to be sitting there managing systems and then reading a Kindle and then punching in another <laughs> command and then well, reading the Kindle some more, or maybe watching television? There, there are, f are many folks who believe that autonomous vehicles uh, are in our future, and. Uh, I tend to be not uh, in the same uh, camp with Tom, that is to say, neither a pessimist nor an optimist with respect to the computer, uh, with technology in general. Uh, let me uh, answer your question this way. I asked the director of research at Google, that's come one of the companies that's been developing autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. and who is a Brown graduate, uh, how they mapped 
the, the streets. For example, I said, let's suppose a vehicle is traveling down the street and it sees a red light. Can it tell if it's a stoplight on the vehicle or a stoplight, a traffic stoplight? And he said, well, we map out the streets. We know exactly where all the lights are, or the stationary lights. And then, of course, the immediate thought I had was, fine, but what happens if there's been uh, new construction at the intersection and the stop sign replaces the traffic light? What if the street gets torn up or there's a flood? How is the autonomous vehicle going to function in that case? And the answer is it's not going to function well. So to me, that means that, well, for s on some roads that are well marked, that are in good condition, autonomous vehicles are probably going to be fine. But if you intend to travel through many American cities which are in a state of disrepair and expect your autonomous vehicle is going to work correctly, I think you're expecting too much. And, and they, can I build on that? Yeah, yeah. Please. because <laughs> I, I think that's exactly right. And in some ways, we're, again, asking the wrong question, those who are trying to build autonomous. We should be asking the question of how do we build a transportation system that yes. is efficient, that is safer, that gives more people access to transportation, and then let's figure out, uh, as many of the technologists are doing now, how can we use technology to enable the transportation system? So we're, we're all now, if you buy a new car, you get uh, brake assistance, you get uh, telling you if you're going out of a lane, it tells you if there's another car coming up behind you, all of that is making it safer, and that's fantastic. And it's enabling us as drivers to be more intelligent about how we drive. That's the way in which we can use technology to solve big problems. But I defy anyone to drive around Boston in a, a driver in driverless vehicle because the streets are always changing. That's right. Right around where I, I go to work every day ev because there's so much construction at Kendall Square in Boston that uh, the streets change. I want, the conditions I, I want to bring Linda in, but I, I want to know how many people will find ways of disrupting these vehicles out of pure malice oh, or will. fun. Oh, of course Who will, will stand up with a red lantern, uh, etc. This, this is something... The modern Luddite. The modern... Well, possibly, yeah. Oh, well, Linda, or just the, Linda, the you're, hacker. You're not an engineer yeah. and you're no. not associated with the Wright University, no. although you did get a, a university. <laughs> not now. Uh, uh, um, how do you see this? The future of work. Are you are you enthusiastic or pessimistic? And I, I'm pessimistic myself. And what I'm pessimistic about is not people like the three of you, who obviously enormous intellectual ability, and and you know will find something to do, but people more like my father, who worked with his hands, or people who drive trucks, or people who. Uh, used to put up the copper wires, and now we use this, and there are fewer copper wires. Well, I think you're talking about something that really, uh, you know, gets to the root of a lot of anxiety. Um, are you going to be able to retrain? You know, if you are like Llewellyn's father, who was, uh, you know, who, who was an, an engineer, basically a mechanic, um, are you going to be able to enter this? this world where it really requires a lot of learning, a degree, an advanced degree many times, I mean, to get, to get into it. So you've been, a, you've been a mechanic all these years and then all of a sudden you lose your job and now you're going to, in order to, you know, survive, you're going to have to learn this new stuff. Can, can you really learn this? You can um, learn it if we anticipate it and we engage in lifelong learning and training before the crisis, before the job displacement. It's very difficult to retrain someone who's going through uh, an emotional and financial crisis of a layoff. Oh, it's the truth. So what we need and to age, do, but we age, can. Age well, age but even a, uh, age is a... You retrain somebody in their 20s, but in their 50s, it's a lot harder. I've I seen a lot of auto workers who have adapted to the more robotic and uh, computer science driven technologies of the auto industry with training that is is incremental because they understand how to build cars right. and they can adapt to the to the new technology. Okay, now now for example in the in the automobile industry right now we have a lot of you know machine learning that is sure. supervised. But I think what everybody worries about is what happens when it's unsupervised. You know, when you finally do have the robot doing the job. 
Um, this is the sort of the coming new age of unsupervised, you know, machine learning. And that's going to open this, I think, this gigantic new world for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to need to find our place in that. I think the place that we're going to have to find in that is, is when the machine makes decisions that we're going to need to interpret, the sort of interpretability. Machines will make decisions that we we won't be able to interpret. Um, you know, for instance, if there are job applications and machines have certain biases and all of a sudden they're hiring all sorts of people that are based on the biases that, you know, that have been programmed into it, we're going to have to understand what happened there, you know, in order to employ people and in order to do, you know, things that, like loan applications in a bank or, you know, I mean, uh, something medical, uh, you know, uh, uh, treatments in, in medicine that are, are going to come unsupervised and they're going to come quite quickly. We are going to be like the Sherpas, I think, for I, these I machines. I think, Glenn, I'm going to interrupt because I want to do station identification, but I do think, Is that, that's I think you've got to think in terms of artificial intelligence actually thinking actually dealing with these kinds That's of what I variables. Mean. Yeah, the You're saying that a machine can't deal with variables, but if a machine can think, it can deal with variables. And I have a variable that I can't get away from, and that is every week I have to say hello to our listeners on Sirius XM Radio, Channel 124, the POTUS Channel. You are listening to White House Chronicle. Special guest today, Thomas Kokan, who is professor of management at MIT Sloan School and who studies the future of work, and John Savage, who is a professor of computing science at Brown University and one of the pioneers in the computing world. Uh, you can reach these very distinguished gentlemen uh, on the web or at least see their work. If you want to reach uh, 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 Thomas, his email, or go to this site, iwe.mit.edu. And uh, if you want to reach or see the work of John Savage, cs.brown.edu. CS, of course, computer science. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the uh, subject. To you have got to conceive of a machine that can do deductive thinking. We are and very we don't far know how to do that. And we are very but far they're playing, from, I think, they're playing chess back. and there's a lot of deduction in playing chess and that is totally, but absolutely terrifying. But we're far from machines that exhibit general intelligence. Um, oh no, they're, they're right coming along. They're well, coming along. Jo John, John jump in there. Jump in there. How intelligent are they? Uh, they, you know, let me put it this way, back in the 60s, the, those folks who called themselves uh, artificial <laughs> intelligence uh, researchers were, were forecasting that they could build computers that would play chess and as well as a chess master. That didn't happen for decades. Uh, on your point, Linda, of uh, machines that are uh, display intelligence have been taught to how to respond to stimuli. Uh, the stimuli, the training set, will change because mm -hmm. the circumstances change. And you do need people to do the retraining. So yes. there will be work there. There is those, work. Right. We're, we're the retrainers. We are <laughs> That's correct. We are the data scientists and the machine learning expert retrainers. And then you will find also that you need to supervise these machines because if the circumstances under which they're operating, the conditions under which they're operating change, you want to note that. Right. You want to fix it. So there's going to be plenty of work. I'm, I'm not, you know, I look at uh, with uh, a bit of awe and uh, <coughs> a bit of uh, con confusion at the fact that I, we can at home order through Amazon a package, a good, mm -hmm. it will arrive within a day or two. And then what is not recognized is there has to be fleets and fleets of delivery people and trucks in that industry, the trucking industry, apparently it has a shortage of drivers. Yeah. Who would have forecast that? Well, Who would have said, with computers, we've automated everything, and look, uh, we've reduced uh, the workload. None well, I, I can tell you about the shortage of drivers, and it's occasion.
like to uh, welcome everyone to the Glen County Mainland Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, June 4th, uh, 2019. Uh, I'd like to also remind you to please silence your cell phones. And we are going to start this meeting with an invocation and a prayer. And if you'd like to join us, please stand. Tonight, we have several public hearing items, so I need to um, remind everyone of the meeting procedures. Uh, the planning staff presents the application request to the planning commission during the staff's report. This report uh, evaluates how the proposal conforms to the Glen County Zoning Ordinance and other applicable regulations uh, and conforms to the comprehensive plan when applied to zoning matters and ordinances. Applicants shall have the opportunity to present their request to the Planning Commission. It is the responsibility of the applicant to make presentations on request and to address any conditions or factual findings with which they do not agree. Public hearings and public comments will be limited to 30 minutes for each opposing side with a maximum of five minutes allotted to each speaker. Comments are to be limited to relevant information regarding your position and should avoid being repetitious. If your group has a spokesman, please allow that individual to present your group's position in the time allotted. The applicant may then provide a rebuttal to any testimony. The chairman may terminate testimony if it becomes repetitive. The chairman will terminate a speaker's time if the speaker begins personal attacks. Your co cooperation in this process will be greatly appreciated. Uh, our first order of business will be to approve the minutes from our meeting on May 7th, 2019. Commissioners? Mr. Chairman, I move the minutes to be approved as written. <coughs> we have a motion made and seconded to approve the minutes as written. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous, Janet. Uh, our first item tonight it is a public hearing item on a zoning decision. It's uh, ZM4006 at uh, 101 Touchstone Parkway Rezone. Again, property address is 101 Touchstone Parkway. Parcel ID 18944, 1.05 acres. Current zoning is restricted neighborhood commercial. Proposed zoning is local commercial. Charles Hall applicant and agent for Maynard Levi Yoder owner. Mrs. Lee. Ms. Lee. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. Stephanie Leaf, planning manager. Uh, the applicant, uh, Mr. Hall, did contact me earlier today asking for this application to be deferred to the July 2nd Mail and Planning Commission meeting. And so if the uh, commission is interested in deferring it, uh, you would need to uh, make a motion to vote on that to defer. Um, however, it has been legally uh, noticed for a public hearing tonight, so it is also your option if you want to have the public hearing and take action this evening. That is also a, a right of the commission. But the applicant has requested deferral. Okay. Uh, commissioners, do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to defer ZM4006-101 Touchstone Park re Rezone till the July 2nd meeting. We have a motion to defer uh, uh, zoning application ZM4006 to the July 2nd meeting. Uh, any discussion? Are there any uh, people that uh, would want to speak on this? No, sir. Uh, we'll entertain a motion, or the motion is on the floor, excuse me, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous, thank you. Uh, this uh, case is deferred. Uh, 
Our next item is a conditional use permit, uh, CUP 4005, pet doctor conditional use permit. Property address is 110 Anderson Way. Parcel ID is 03-21915, 1,500 square feet unit in a condo building. The cur current zoning is highway commercial. Uh, it is a veterinarian office um, and uh, Nicola Overman is the owner. Mr. Postal. Okay. Maurice Postal, Planning and Zoning Division. Uh, the reason for this permit is uh, the conditional use permit is required within the Highway Commercial Zoning District for a animal hospital or boarding facility. The applicant has had an occupational license for the business for the past 18 years. The previous location was in a forest agricultural zoning district where animal hospitals are simply permitted uses. The applicant updated its address with the uh, Ac Occupational Tax Office this past March. It was at that time that planning and zoning staff advised the applicant that they would need to apply for a conditional use permit. And the applicant submitted that application on March 23rd of this year. Uh, the site is in a medium de density residential land use category, but it has been zoned highway commercial since 1974. Uh, as for neighborhood compatibility, all of the lots in Anderson Way are zoned for either commercial or office uses. There are single family homes behind the business and directly across the street from the business. But the business is only open three days per week. It does not have nighttime or weekend business hours and it doesn't board any animals. And it appears to not create very many vehicular trips going to and from the business. Uh, this is an aerial of Anderson Way. This is the uh, pet doctor right here, and these are the other units in the condo building. And here's his single family home back here, and other ones right here. And as you can see, it's zoned highway commercial. This is office commercial down here, and then R9 here, and to the southwest of the site. And there's the view of the pet doctor office. And your possible actions are to recommend approval, recommend approval with conditions, defer the action or recommend denial. And the recommended motion is to uh, recommend to the Board of Commissioners approval of this application. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, any questions for staff? Okay, would, uh, this is a public hearing item. Would the uh, owner please come forward and request action? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. I am Dr. Nicola Overman, and I graduated Mississippi State in 1994 and since been in this community for the past 25 years, serving pretty much all the animal um, people plus some other organizations that are nonprofit. And just recently relocated the office to this new location, um, which was zoned commercial highway, so I really didn't expect any issues at the time when uh, we moved in there. So I would like for you to approve this and let us continue to serve the community. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, as I mentioned, this is a public hearing item. So anyone wishing to speak in favor of this application, please step forward and introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Sandy Jones. I live at uh, 508 First Avenue in downtown Brunswick. I absolutely encourage you to approve this uh, zoning for Dr. Overman. She's been my vet for 25 years. I, she serves the community well. We need her, we need her closer in than Pinnock Road, although it's a beautiful drive, it's a lot more convenient to me uh, on Anderson and um, I don't know of anybody more ethical, more professional, and more caring. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of this application? 
Hearing none, we will close the floor for a favor. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Good evening. My name is Gwen Nave, and I live in Ellis Point. I'm at 356 Shore Drive. I live right behind the office building in question. Well, I say office building. I've lived there for 30 years never knew or never saw a sign that said that this particular building was highway commercial. I don't remember it ever being rezoned highway commercial or a sign with public notice saying that it was highway commercial. I have met the very veterinarian and she's a very nice lady and has a booming business going. When Jeff Chapman was our commissioner, in our district. He said the road coming in there to the veterinarian's office next door to the master loop, which is highway commercial, is one of the most dangerous highways to get in and out of in all of Glen County. And school bus drivers have said that. And we have had uh, a fatality there and several wrecks because it's very difficult to get in and out at the master loop. You have to enter from the rear and exit from the front. And the veterinarian office, like I say, has a booming business. I'm sure she does a wonderful job and very well-liked person. And I've seen nice horse trailers up there with big horses getting out to be treated. And I'm sure that's what you have to do when you're a veterinarian. But I thought that she was moving in up there to use that as an office and one of my main concerns is if the veterinarian office goes in there, well, first of all, I thought if it's already zoned on the paper, it says highway commercial, why would you even need a permit? Highway commercial is top of the line. You can put just about anything in there. So I don't understand that. And there's four units in that building. And from what I understand, they're all on septic tanks. And so how is that going to affect that? and I'm sure that Glen County has looked into that and if they give baths. And on the back of the building, they have built a screened in porch and the distance from that porch to the first house is about as far as from me to your chairs. So that abuts right up to the neighbor's bedroom. So, I think that my main question is, if this is approved, then what else can be approved to go in there? And since it is listed that it's uh, as condo, who's to say that won't be turned into another extended stay at some point? We have approximately 150 homes that go in and out between Anderson Estate and Ellis Point to get into their homes. We have 150 families that live back in there. 99% of those homes are owner occupied, very, very little rentals, two and three generations of people. Homes don't come up for sale in there very often. When they do, a lot of times they're bought out by other family members. So we just want to say, if you will, please be careful as to what goes in to that area because we're concerned about the traffic. But the main concern is, if this needs a special permit, what else is gonna come in that's gonna need another permit? And then what's gonna be there if they purchase the other property around it? Are we gonna have motels at our front door and extended stay places that really attract undesirable people? So just keep this in mind that this is a nice, quiet family neighborhood. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Please step forward and introduce yourself. My name is Reba Renee. I live in Ellis Point. I've lived there more than 40 years. Probably, I've lived there probably 45 years. I exit, I leave my property. I live right at the very dead end of um, Shore Drive, which um, Anderson Way, Anderson Way turns into Anderson Drive and Anderson Drive connects with um, Ellis um, Shore Drive. I have lived there before Anderson Estates even got uh, in that area. That's why there's 
the two roads join, although it's, it's two separate um, subdivisions. So I've lived there for a long time, and I, I exit in and out, and I'm very observant of my neighborhood, of anyone coming in and coming out. Also, um, I, I have not seen any um, posting that this p um, particular building is, is uh, zoned highway commercial. Several years ago, there is a, a piece of property right across the street on it facing 341 that they wanted to put, um, uh, what do you call it? A what? Flea market. Yeah, they wanted to put a flea market there. And our neighborhood got together and we worked hard to keep that flea market from coming in there because of the, the amount of traffic as well. It's very dangerous um, exit coming out uh, and leaving that. Um, my concern is what next? Because this building, when it was uh, built, is to be an office building, not commercial. I don't have a pet, so I don't know what kind of a business it is. I prefer not to have a pet. I get too close to them. To me, they're like one of my children. But uh, I don't have one now since the last one I had died several years ago. But um, I, w I pray that you would uh, reconsider this because um, we're under the impression that it's office, not commercial. And along with my neighbors, we are concerned about what next will be allowed to come into our neighborhood. And I thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Hearing none, we will close the floor. Um, commissioners, I'll open it up for discussion. Steffi, could you come up here and explain to this lady, or Maurice, one of you, explain why this has to have a condition of use even though it's zoned highway commercial, just to kind of clear that up to start with. Right, section 713, which is highway commercial, specifically states that animal hospitals need a conditional use permit. So that's, that's the reason why it's not a simple permitted use, it is a use that requires a conditional use permit. Which, which zonings allow a veterinarian office without a special use? Uh, definitely forest agriculture. Is that the other one? I'm not sure, but okay. definitely parts agriculture where the business originally was located. And, and if, if I understand what we have before us is that there's not gonna be any grooming, there's not gonna be any boarding, it's strictly gonna be a, a business that's gonna be open in the daytime, not at night, not, at week, not on weekends, not on holidays, and so it, it, you know, it's, that's because as they pointed out, it's on a septic system. Right. So the health department has told them that they can't board or groom animals there. So that. Uh, or that's correct, specifically because of the septic issues as stated in the environmental health report that I put in your packet, they can only be open three days a week. They can't have nights and weekend hours and they can't board or groom animals and they can't discharge certain things into the septic tank. Dr. Oldman, if you come back up here, if we, could, if we have questions for you. Since you're only gonna be open three days a week and you won't be open nighttime or weekends or anything, if we all know animals have emergencies just like people do. Yes, so sir. where then would they be treated if that was the case? Well, um, the way we do business is, and that's been for many years, is that I provide house call services on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we actually go to people's homes on those two days. So that is the reason why we're not there on Tuesdays and Thursdays. On Mondays and Wednesdays are the only days that we actually 
have a drop off or a surgery case that might stay with us. Only have five cage spaces which is just allowed for the surgery cases as well as a sick animal. Now, since we don't do any boarding or grooming, those animals are usually taken out to use the restroom before they go into surgery as well as after surgery before they go home. So we do not really have any type of material going down the sink or even the toilet other than normal. We have two restrooms in the building other than you know, staff use and, and client use. And any of the organic material, like say for surgeries, um, such as, you know, when we do a spay or neuter, those items actually go into a separate bag that they gets picked up by um, Paws Cremation down out of Jacksonville. They're the ones that provide our cremation service for us. And they usually pick up on Tuesdays and Fridays to take animals that need to be cremated or, you know, biological waste that we may have generated that particular week. You're a rare doctor that makes house calls. Yeah, I love it. It's nice to get out <laughs> of the regular trip. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Overman, oh, oh, yeah. can, can you address, there were a couple of concerns, not only about the septic tanks, but there was one about a screen porch uh, that was close to a property line out, uh, just you don't answer on the building, correct? You lease the space. No, actually, I purchased oh, you did. that okay. particular unit of the. It was a three-unit. Um, well, I think they subdivided one of the second units, but there's three actual addresses, and I purchased the last unit, which is where the pet doctor is located right now, and the owner of the building knew that that. I was planning on moving my office because we were running out of space and I needed a little bit more room, a little bit more local in town. And um, so that was purchased. So anything that happens to the building, I'm a third responsible for any repairs, such as the roof, the taxes, um, anything that's done to the lawn, yard work, the mailboxes, all of that. What's the clean pool fee for? Sir? Oh, we had to um, have a place to put our wash machine, and that is the only thing that was added to that building by a plumber that is going into the septic tank. However, since we're only there two days a week, we only generate laundry pretty much on Mondays and Wednesdays, which is just usually a few towels and some surgery material, like the drapes and stuff that get washed. That's, that's Doc, a lesson in my home. <laughs> Dr. Oberman, one of, one of the... Uh, speakers addressed, uh, I know you said you don't do grooming, but one of the speakers talked about bathing the animals. Now, is that something that you do there? No, ma'am. Okay. We don't do any bathing, grooming, or boarding. Okay. I think the only dogs that have ever been bathed, and we have like, it's not even a sink. It's like a wet table, like just a longer area as my own personal dogs. So, no. Thank you. Dr. Oberman, I have one, one other question. One of the other issues that were brought up uh, is the increase in traffic. Um, and the statement was made a couple times that you have a, a booming business. What would you say your, uh, the daily traffic intake into your facility is? Well, as a matter of fact, when I first purchased the building, I didn't really realize that there was a fairly big neighborhood behind further back um, after you pass our building. Because when we were in there repainting and doing things, we saw a lot of traffic going in and out and actually took a drive around the neighborhood to see what the neighborhood was like. And um, we've actually um, gained quite a few new clients from that particular neighborhood, including the neighbors right behind us, or I would say behind that screen porch, the end of the building, that all have now started bringing their pets to us as well. I uh, really haven't had any major concerns. Of course, we do have a dog barking here and there, especially on Mondays and Wednesdays, but it probably is no more than you would get from your neighbor's dogs. Okay. Because usually once they enter our building and they're there for surgery, we give them pre-medication to, it's kind of like a doggy volume to kind of subdue them to a certain degree so that they won't be stressed while with us. 
on, on, a, on a daily basis, how many patients would you, you say you see? That stay with us or that we see? Well, just, just um, come in and out of the office. Um, much. I would say on an average probably about 10. Okay. Uh, I don't have we any only see appointments in the morning until 10 o'clock. Uh, usually we start at 9, have usually two or three appointments in the morning. Then I do surgery and we start appointments back at 2 o'clock and we're open till 5. So, and, and I see appointments every 30 minutes. So sometimes there are other people coming in and out to purchase medications uh, without a pet. But other than that, um, as far as me seeing any patients, I would say 10. But with people coming in buying medications, it might be more like 15 or 20. I'm not sure. Okay. Commissioners, any further questions? Yes, Mr. I'm Smith. Dr. Oldman. Um, That, that was I, my fault. I interrupted you. Any further questions? Okay. Um, I will entertain one. Miss Oldman, you did you say you own the whole building now? No, sir. Just, just it's that, like a commercial a condo. So there's three units right. in the condo, and I just own a third of the building. Okay. So the very last unit. And does the same person own the other two? Yes, sir. Okay, and, and you don't know if they have any plans to? No, it has been just rented out to different medical offices as well as a tutoring place. There's been accounting places in their offices, but I was told when we moved in there, which I was unaware aware of at the first, that you know the two offices beside us are a psychologist and a, a child neurologist, and that I was not aware that I had to have a special permit to be able to see just because pets are walking into my building versus animals, um, people walking into the other building where you right. don't have to have a special use permit. I, I know it's been zoned highway commercial for yes, a long sir. time yes. because when I was on the board of commissioners, I've been to meetings in that building. Yeah, there used to be yes. a nursing some type of nursing facility in there, and I've been to meetings in that building, yeah, so I know As far as I know, there's been several different offices right. in there, including anything from doctors to accounting and insurance, so um, it's you. been zoned commercial highway for quite some time. Yeah, any other questions? Commissioners? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. We have a motion on the floor and a second to approve um, conditional use permit CUP 4005. Any discussion? Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, our next item is uh, site plan uh, SP 3961. Uh, the chapel at 114 Harris Farm Road, parcel ID 03-02984, uh, 2.31 uh, acres, currently zoned highway commercial. Uh, it is a church and um, the chapel is the applicant. Well, we Coastal Planning and Zoning Division again. Uh, if you'll recall, this application was originally scheduled to go at the April MPC, but the applicant withdrew due to potential parking concerns. This application is considering site plan approval for the addition of 5,412 square feet of building space to the church's existing sanctuary building. And as noted, the chapel is a currently existing and operating church near the intersection of Cypress Mill and Golden Isles Parkway. The site consists of the main sanctuary building and four additional campus buildings. And uh, this application mostly concerns additions to the sanctuary, including a new porta cache, lobby tower, atrium, and additional seating. And here is the last version of the site plan. Here's the main sanctuary building that's going to be renovated and added to. And here are the other buildings. And these are the additional lots owned by the church. 
where they would have parking on Sundays. And this is a picture of the current sanctuary building. Um, this is conceptual elevations for the renovated sanctuary building showing the porte de the atrium, and the new lobby tower. And as noted, there were parking concerns at the, before the April meeting. Uh, churches are required to have one parking space for every four sanctuary seats. The chapel would like to renovate the building to have up to, well, to have 784 sanctuary seats. By the zoning ordinance, that means they would have to have 196 parking spaces. Uh, in May, the applicant went to the Board of Appeals <coughs> to ask to be allowed to provide all their required parking spaces with the existing parking on the subject lot and on the additional lots that they also own in the area. And they were approved on May 9th. And the applicant is also providing the 95 supplemental parking spaces that the two strip malls noted in their April application. And there also still are the 17 parking spaces in the right of way that they can't count as required parking spaces, but those parking spaces don't appear to serve any other businesses or buildings on that street. I've been there multiple times on weekdays and it's always just one SUV parked there. And this is the map of all the different parking calculations. They're providing 59 in the actual subject church lot they own this lot up here, they're providing another 33 spaces. They own this lot across the street, they're gonna be providing 40. And they own these two commercial lots down here. This is the coffee shop and this is another commercial lot right next to it and they're gonna have 30 there. And here's the quest lot where they're providing 43 spaces through agreement and the CSW lot where there are additional 52 spaces that they're adding through agreement and those 17 public right away spaces are right here. And your possible motions are to approve the application, to approve with conditions, defer or deny, or recommending approval of the site plan application as presented. Um, commissioners, any uh, questions for staff? I would first like to say I'm glad that you're here because I never would have been able to pronounce Porta Cachet. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> I hear um, the building department talk about court porta cachets all the time, otherwise <laughs> I wouldn't be able to pronounce it either. Um, and the applicant's engineer is here tonight to ask for action and to answer questions. Okay. So would the um, applicant please come forward and request action? Hey, good afternoon. I'm uh, Jonathan McDill with Robert Civil Engineering and um, here to ask that you approve the application as presented. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them as best as I can. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? Are all the um, parking areas owned by the church improved parking areas? No, ma'am. Um, the, the 40 lots are 12. Mm -hmm. I can't see the, the parcel number. It is a wooded lot, but it is currently being used for parking. Um, the one in the back, in the rear, I believe is still, it's being used for parking, but it's not to the degree that we are showing that it could be. Where the, the 33 is marked, is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir, yes, sir. It, 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 the potential is, is very, it, it's very easy for them to be able to get to the 33. Um, and <clears throat> the variance, the reason we structured the variance the way we did is it, it allows the church to operate and have just the number of parking under their control to be able to use just that but they do have currently they have the 95 and the additional parking spaces that that exceeds what's required okay so i have a staff question um if they lost the leases on the two lots would the county go back and make them make those true improved um parking lots and can you have an improved parking lot for a church in R12 zoning? Uh, because of the variance, the two supplemental parking lots aren't really in play anymore. As he stated, that's kind of why they did it the way they did it. And uh, churches are a conditional use within R12. Okay. Uh, but I don't think we could 
forth from the paved. So normally, if, if parking spaces to be counted for this process, do they have to be improved? Not a wooded lot. I think as long as they meet the space requirements, the nine by 18 in the zoning ordinance, I think we, they're, they're allowed. I don't think we have to require that they be improved. Is that correct? Yeah. Great, thank you. Any further questions for the applicant? Uh, the applicant is providing all the required buffers that the zoning ordinance requires. Uh, there are variances for buffers, but they didn't ask for any. Right, right, no, they didn't ask any <coughs> for variances for landscape buffers. So can I make sure I understand that the two leases that we have for parking spaces, you're saying that additional parking that really does not, that doesn't go into the to the required spaces, is that correct? Right, because of the variance approved in May, all of the required spaces can be gained on these lots that they that the church owns directly. Okay. These two other lots are now just supplemental parking. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve SP 3961 as presented. We have a motion and a second to approve um, SP 3961. Uh, any discuss in a second? Did we have any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous, Janet. Okay. Our last item. Our last item is uh, SP four zero zero nine High Stay Hotel. Property address is 3030 Scarlet Street, parcel ID 03-03655, 2.57 acres, zoned freeway commercial for a hotel, and the applicant is SW Scarlet Property, LLC, and AEW Property, LLC. Okay. Ms. Lee. Great, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, currently a hotel site, but has been vacant for a number of years. Um, and they are proposing to do a new extended stay hotel. Uh, here is the property here. It is zoned freeway commercial and it is surrounded by freeway commercial zoning. Uh, this is Scarlet Street here. Um, adjacent to the property is a Motel 6 and this is um, the exit 36 area. Uh, so the property was formerly a travel lodge um, at exit 36 and they are proposing the 125 room um, extended stay hotel. Uh, they are adding some additional square footage around the perimeter of the building. Um, so basically the um, uh, the shape of the building will, will stay the same, but they will be adding some uh, square footage around the perimeter to expand. And um, they currently do not have um, a type E buffer and are not proposing a type E buffer along the frontage along Scarlet Street. Um, the existing driveway extends to the property line. So there is pavement to the property line. So un unless um, they were to remove pavement and then that would um, narrow their drive aisle, um, that's really the only way they could do a, a type E buffer. Um, but in the right of way, there are some trees there. So they do naturally buffer, but we don't count anything in the right of way as, as counting. But um, so they, they are requesting a modification to the buffer requirements for that. So this is a survey of the property. This is Scarlet Street at the top of the screen. Uh, this is their access into the property. And then it is um, kind of this just U-shaped with a courtyard in the middle. This is Motel 6 over here. And this is their site plan that they're proposing. So they are, um, this is the additional area, I'm sorry, this is the additional area that they are adding, this kind of in the dark shaded and then they will be remodeling the courtyard area. And then the parking configuration and the drive aisle will remain the same, of course, with improvements, but um, same area. And then, um, and I'll show you on the site plan. So this is where um, the, currently their drive aisle is right here to their property line. Um, there are a few trees in the right of way, about six trees um, in this location here. This is um, building elevations I've proposed. 
And here's some photos of the existing facility. Um, so it's definitely a lot of um, room for improvement at this location. So there is a, a, a fence along the property line right now. And you can see the parking in the drive aisle. And this is their courtyard. And they currently have an existing pylon sign that has been painted over. Um, but they would most likely be using, utilizing that. And then uh, these are your possible motions. So if you do move to approve it, you also be approving the modification to the buffer along Scarlet Street. Um, and then you could uh, approve the application with conditions, defer it, or deny the site plan. And staff's recommendation is to approve the application as presented with the buffer modification. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And Chris Amos is here representing the applicant. If you have any questions of him. Okay. Are, are they going to start from scratch? with this thing or are they just gonna renovate what is currently there? Mm -hmm. That hotel has been there for years and years. Is there gonna be any problems with structural damage to that thing? I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was open right after Interstate 95 was open mm -hmm. back in the early 80s mm -hmm. and maybe even before that, so. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so I'm just curious as to, you know, as, as far as structural damage in one thing or another to this thing, who's going to make sure that this thing is is safe and for the public and mm -hmm. et cetera? Yeah. I think I'd like to talk a little bit more about kind of the current condition and what they've done so far to um, analyze that. But yeah, our, our, uh, so they will, after the site, if the site plan is approved and they will apply for their commercial building permit and through that process, our um, building officials and uh, fire department will do a thorough analysis to make sure that this redevelopment um, does, meet, does meet current codes. But they, it is a redevelopment um, and, and heavy remodel, but it's not, it, they're not demolishing the structure, um, to my knowledge, really any part of it to rebuild. Is they can it, talk a little bit more about it, that. Is it currently on Joint Water and Sewer Commission water and sewage? Or does it, I noticed yeah. the, the packet says mm -hmm. it is, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't think that when that hotel was built that that was, those, those services were provided out in that area. Hmm. Yeah, the, um, Joint Water and Sewer um, did review the project, um, and they said it was compliant. Um, so they, uh, yeah, they do have service out in that area. Um, and Environmental Health, who typically will review it, uh, or who, who will review it if there's septic or well. Um, so there's not yeah, going to be any, there, apparently there was yeah. no issues with Joint Water and Sewer Commission with capacity for not a 125 room hotel in that area? Um, they did not indicate that there was any issues with that. Well, they approved compliant, mm -hmm. listed as compliant with no mm -hmm. comments. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for staff? Will the applicant please come forward and request action? Um, the good news about this property is it's built like a fort. It's concrete floors, concrete walls, concrete ceiling. It's, so it's basically a fort. And so we're just going to be able to come back in with all new electricity, all new plumbing, um, all new everything. Nothing that's there will be salvaged. The fronts will be taken out, air conditioners. Nothing's there will remain except the concrete. We're basically starting with a concrete, concrete fort. Recording oh yes, I'm, I'm Bobby Wilkes. Robert Wilkes is my official name. Herman Wilkes' son for all those old timers here. So you're going to use the existing structures and then build out from there? Exactly. Yes, sir. Okay. All new flooring, structure. all new walls. I mean, the walls are concrete now, but the um, all new electricity, all new conduit, all new plumbing. Even we're going to uh, the all the galvanized stuff's gonna come out. Um, and there is joint water and sewer. The, the sewer does come right up to us. Uh, we're gonna have to get water to us. Um, and we've, we've spoken to, uh, and we're gonna have to get gas, Atlanta Gas Light. They're gonna run gas to us. So it's gonna be all new systems, all new everything when we're done. They 
Right. I can't so, see that far. Is it possible <laughs> to bring that over here? Sure, absolutely. Is this going to be a more of an extended stay, or is it going to be an overnight stay, hotel, motel? I know sometimes extended stay motels and hotels they have a tendency to as time goes on the clientele kind of gets worse and worse. If you don't mind coming back to the mic, just so we can make sure we get everything on the on the recording. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilkes. Is I stay part of a, um, a chain or no, a sir. local? It's just uh, yeah. My my business partner's wife came up with it. She's a big I, iPhone fan, and she, we're going to try to have very fast internet connections and be uh, cutting edge for technology and um, you know flat screen TVs and stuff. So we want it to be a clean, nice place with very fast internet connections. So kind of on the iPad, I stay iPhone, kind of in the technology genre. You know, so we just, and there was no I stay studio hotel out there. So we just, we decided that's our working title for now. It could change. That's creative. <coughs> We're, um, it's probably gonna take 12 months a minimum to build to build it out um, and so we do have a couple of lenders interested in giving us the money thank goodness and so uh, but there, that's going to take 60 days to 90 days to close as soon as we get the uh, uh, permits and stuff so if we can start in two months from now or three months from now then one year later hopefully opening sure. any further questions for the applicant I have one question uh, Extended stay, uh, will you provide washer dryer service within each unit or will that be somewhere on the property? Yes, ma'am, but it's not gonna be within the unit, but we're gonna have two different washer and dryer. We're gonna have a one room dedicated to washers and dryers for people out of town that need to wash their stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have one room where we can wash uh, folks stuff because some of the various people that we're talking to that want to rent from us, uh, require that we change the sheets and change the towels every once a week or whatever, whatever their requirements are. So we, we will have to provide some of that for, we will have to provide the white washing of the towels and the sheets, but they also will be able to wash their own clothes with a coin operated, actually with a credit card operated system. Okay, but so, so you're talking about how many washers and dryers for 125 rooms? So for the 125 rooms, we're going to have four washers and four dryers that are coin operated for the, for the people. Maybe I actually we'll start with three and three, three washers, three dryers. Believe it or not, and I was shocked, um, the, the folks that did the La Quinta out by the interstate, I called the sales rep that put the, they, they put two washers and two dryers capacity and they're going to have to wash every night because they're a hotel mm -hmm. and we're not a hotel that's washing every night. That the sales rep told me I can get away with one big commercial washer and one big commercial dryer. So we're just gonna go with one and one. He says we're in Jacksonville and Savannah with service reps. If it goes down, we can be there to fix it same day. So they said as long as you have backup, you can get away with one. So that's what we're gonna do. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any further questions? And, and this is my site engineer, Chris Amos, if y'all have questions for him. Well, I know I know people I know people <laughs> from this area are glad to see something finally happen yeah. to that area out there. It's been in sad shape for a long time, and with racetrack just being renovated and 
one thing or another and other businesses out there hopefully that'll continue along exit 36 because it's it's certainly needed throughout there so having said that mr chairman i make a motion to approve sp 4009 i stay hotel uh, this is not a public hearing item i second I have a, a motion and a second to uh, approve SP4009. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. That is unanimous, Janet. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there, step, um, step for uh, Maurice has gone. I didn't think to ask at the beginning of the meeting, are there any planning commission announcements or anything that we should discuss? Have a meeting tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did mention that we do have the um, bylaws joint planning commission meeting tomorrow evening at 530, and that's going to be over in the Pate building, the second floor in room 224, uh, where the uh, county commission has their work sessions. So we do have that going on tomorrow. Um, and I just, I don't think there's any other updates I can think of now. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Ma'am, I would just like to say that the, um, the public is invited to speak for public hearing items only and um, site plans are not public hearing items. So forgive me that, I didn't mean to call you down, so. Sure. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I don't think you're going to find a person on this panel that's going to disagree with you. And, and I think that their, um, their business model is to go after potentially the Fletzy business, uh, that where those people are coming into town to stay for extended periods and, and uh, paid for by the, the government, if you will. So. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. And um, with that, we are adjourned.